Every athlete, no matter what sport they're involved in, has a ticking clock against them. And that's because at a certain point, the human body just can't be expected to perform the same feats it had during its early years. So that's why most wrestlers get involved in the sport at a young age, with them spending their youth working their way up and usually hitting their prime by their 30s. But what happens when someone forgoes this standard path and doesn't get started until relatively late in life? Well, as it happens, this can, on occasion, give us some of the best performers of their era. Yes, being late to the party doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to make it. But who are the best examples of this? Well, join us as we take a deep dive into late bloomers, wrestlers who started at a late age. And where better to begin than with arguably the biggest star of them all who got going at a relatively late point in life? Yes, while well, other late 90s performers such as Steve Austin, The Rock, and Bill Goldberg started out their runs in their 20s, it wasn't until he was 35 that Diamond Dallas Page would begin his training. Of course, realizing that he had no time to waste then, DDP would force himself to become a quick learner, with his technique of laying out his matches beat for beat helping him to speed up the process. On top of this, being an early adopter of the ice bath post-match, he was able to stop his more worn-out joints from swelling up so easily, allowing him to keep up with his younger counterparts. And all that would see him quickly find success then, as after having gotten to know the industry as a manager in the years prior to this, he was able to navigate the ring with ease and become United States champion by the time 1994 rolled around. But that was far from his peak though, because right as the boom period was picking up and wrestling was going mainstream once more, Page would turn into one of World Championship Wrestling's few homegrown stars when, after turning down an offer to join the NWO, he'd find himself in a top babyface position. So running with that, he'd work his way up to the main event where he'd feud with Hulk Hogan, at one point notably teaming up with basketball star Karl Malone during a tag team encounter pitting them against the Hulkster and Dennis Rodman. Then by 1999, he'd go a step further when he won the World Heavyweight title for the first time in a moment which solidified him as a top guy for the rest of his career. Sadly though, his momentum wouldn't be enough to stop WCW from going out of business a couple of years later. And while DDP's subsequent run over in WWF would never quite see him reach the same heights, it would be around about this time when another late bloomer was first starting to make an impact on the main roster, and that was none other than Dave Bautista. Yes, the animal, the six-time world champion, and the man who's since gone on to conquer Hollywood in such blockbuster hits as Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers Infinity War, and Dune didn't actually get started as a wrestler until he was 30 years old. And why was this? Well, prior to hitting the ring, Big Dave had a whole other career as a bodybuilder and occasional nightclub bouncer. That said, after an incident which occurred while he was working as the latter caused him to have to undergo a year's probation, this, combined with the fact he had so little money he couldn't afford to buy Christmas gifts for his children, the future champ would decide to use his impressive physique and athletic skills to his advantage by getting involved in the world of wrestling. So catching the eye of WWE management and being signed up to a developmental contract soon after this, he'd be sent down to Ohio Valley Wrestling, where he'd be part of the same class which would give the world such future stars as Shelton Benjamin, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, and John Cena. Yes, it was quite an array of talent and a lesser performer would have easily gotten lost amongst the shuffle here, especially when they were significantly older than the rest of their peers. That said, Batista had no intentions of letting this opportunity pass him by, and so by 2002, he was on the main roster, with him becoming a member of Evolution alongside Orton, Ric Flair, and Triple H the year after this. And once that was in place, there was no stopping the animal as, after getting over to the point that he became the breakout star of the group, he'd finally end the game's 18-month-long reign of terror when he beat him in the main event of WrestleMania 21 to become the World Heavyweight Champion for the first time. Following that, he was a made man, with his age seeming to be no area of concern for him or anyone else anymore as he became the top guy over on SmackDown for much of the 2000s. But even conquering the ring wouldn't be enough for him because, after leaving WWE in 2010, he'd follow Dwayne Johnson's footsteps when he moved over to a career in Hollywood, there striking it big when he scored the recurring role of Drax the Destroyer in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And once he was established as an actor, he'd bring things full circle when he made a couple of returns to the company which first made him a star, first in 2014 to put over Daniel Bryan, and then again in 2018 to have one last match with his old foe, Triple H. 
Of course, when it comes to our next entry though, retirement is the furthest thing from his mind at the moment as, despite not getting started in the ring until he was 30 as well, Braun Strowman still has a lot of gas left in his tank. Yes, it was a fairly late start for the monster among men, but it wasn't as if he hadn't been doing anything with his life before that because, in his 20s, he'd build up quite a name for himself on the strongman scene. Eventually, though, Braun realized that there was more money to be made as a pro wrestler, and that was why, starting in 2013, he'd begin shifting over to this world upon getting signed up to a developmental contract with WWE at the request of fellow strongman Mark Henry. And after taking one look at his newest acquisition then, Vince McMahon would immediately begin fast-tracking the big man up to the main roster as, by 2015, he'd have become a member of the Wyatt family. Then, just a year later, Strowman would branch out into a singles run when he became the resident giant of the Raw brand, a cartoon monster who looked to have been ripped straight out of the Hulkamania era and placed right into the modern day. But this wouldn't be enough to see him reach the top of the mountain for a while yet, because with the main event scene being dominated by the likes of Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, it would take Braun a further four years to finally win the big one when, at WrestleMania 37, he'd get the better of Bill Goldberg so as to take home the Universal Championship. Since then, though, his star has fallen somewhat, as after being released from WWE in 2021, he'd find himself stuck over in the wastelands of EC3's Control Your Narrative promotion. That said, with new management now being in control over in his original home, there's always the chance he could return before all is said and done. One person who's unlikely to return at this point, though, is a man who first made a name for himself in early to mid-2000s WWE. That's right, it was after getting his start at the tender age of 33 that Gene Snitsky would attempt to prove he had what it took. And this, then, would see him spending the next couple of years working his way up the roster, moving from developmental to heat, then eventually raw. Once there, he'd become notorious for his involvement in the Kane and Lita saga when he kayfabe caused the alt-diva to have a miscarriage, with him from then on gaining a new catchphrase after constantly claiming that it wasn't his fault. Yes, it wasn't a great storyline, and it wasn't as if Snitsky really had the skills in the ring to overcome this either. So that was why, after feuding with Kane for a while following this, he'd sink down into a mid-card role where, upon teaming up with Heidenreich for a while, he'd develop the new gimmick of someone with a foot fetish. But bad creative or not, he wasn't the only older star who was first getting his start during the Ruthless Aggression era, because elsewhere on the roster, not long after he'd turned 38, Rico had decided it was time for him to start training as a wrestler. But why did he wait so long? Well, he'd been busy working as a paramedic and SWAT team member prior to this, all while in between that, he was showing up on American Gladiators. Come 1998, though, he realized it was now or never, and so that was why, after spending some time training at the Empire Wrestling Association in Southern California, he'd do everything he could to get noticed by WWF, with this being something which finally paid off in 2002. Yes, it was then that, debuting as the stylist of Billy and Chuck, Rico would first be introduced to worldwide audiences. Of course, what most didn't realize at the time, however, was that, despite his appearance, he was more than capable of handling himself in the ring, something he showed glimpses of whenever he teamed with his clients in six-man tag matches over the months which followed. Then, when the trio all went their separate ways following the poorly received gay wedding bait and switch later that year, Rico would spend some time as a manager for Three Minute Warning instead all before becoming a full-time competitor himself when he picked up his own manager in the form of Jackie Gaeta. Of course, a big-time win over Ric Flair aside, it quickly became clear that a singles career was not going to be the former stylist's best option, and so it wasn't long before he found a new partner in Charlie Haas, with the two turning out to have such a good chemistry together that they would even become WWE Tag Team Champions for a while. Unfortunately, though, with age catching up to him at this point, he would never go any higher than this, something which led him to leaving WWE soon thereafter and having one more brief run over in All Japan Pro Wrestling before retiring altogether. Sure, some would have said his career was always going to be short-lived given the fact that he hadn't even gotten started until his 30s were drawing to a close, but as it turns out, he's not even the person on this list who began at the oldest age. No, in fact, with him not beginning his training until he was 40 years old, that honor would have to go to the Boogeyman. That's right, the Boogeyman, one of WWE's most enduring silly gimmicks over the last couple of decades, didn't hit screens until 2005, at which point Martin Wright, the man behind the face paint, was already in his fifth decade of life. 
But while it might sound like madness to some to start doing something as physically stressful on the body as pro wrestling at 40, for Wright, it made all the sense in the world. Of course, this sentiment would not be shared by WWE at first though, as after lying about his age in order to get a spot on the fourth season of Tough Enough, only to have the truth later be discovered, he'd be given the boot for being too old. Luckily for him then, someone in the company would see something in him regardless as, after this, he'd be invited to go down to Ohio Valley Wrestling where, under the tutelage of Jim Cornette, he'd develop the character of the Boogeyman. Not long following that, and the Boogeyman would make his way to the main roster where, initially being portrayed as a horror movie villain in the vein of Freddy Krueger, the idea would be that he'd strike fear into the hearts of audiences everywhere. Of course, with the whole thing being a bit too camp to elicit any real scares though, it would soon evolve into more of a comedy gimmick as, with fans in on the joke, they got to watch as the newcomer freaked out the heel roster one at a time, usually before beating them in the ring and stuffing a handful of live worms into their mouth. And perhaps the most notable victim of this would be Booker T, as at WrestleMania 22, the five-time WCW champion would end up falling to the fan favorite in spectacular fashion. That said though, with his advanced age at this point, there was little hope of Martin Wright ever having a blow-away match, and so as time went on, he'd be relegated more and more towards appearing in backstage segments, all before he was released from the company in 2009. And since then, with his character's ability to make cameos not being hindered by age, he's continued to make the occasional return to TV, usually to scare some unsuspecting heel all over again. One person who's unlikely to ever be scared of him though would be Shayna Baszler, someone who, after having a successful first career in UFC as a member of the Four Horsewomen of MMA alongside Ronda Rousey, Marina Shafir, and Jessamyn Duke, she would develop enough shoot fighting skills that, when the world of pro wrestling came calling in 2015, she'd be more than ready. And yes, we know there was that pretty terrible segment when she was booked to be scared to Alexa Bliss's doll Lily, but that aside, there has been little doubt in fans' minds that there are few other women in the industry who could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Queen of Spades. Of course, by the time she got that start though, she was already 35, something which would have been a huge hindrance for most. That said, with her already having plenty of fundamentals from her time in the MMA world, Baszler was able to adapt to a different ring in record time first by spending a couple of years on the indie circuit and over in Japan for stardom, and then by signing up to WWE in 2017. And upon arrival in the company's developmental brand NXT after that, she'd make a quick impact when she became the brand's women's champion on January 27th of the following year, after beating Ember Moon at TakeOver New Orleans. Following that, she'd go on a 133-day long reign as the top dog of the division, with her moving through every opponent put in her path, all up until the point that Kyrie Sane was able to get the better of her at TakeOver Brooklyn 4. Not that this would put the Queen of Spades down for long, however, as just a couple of months later, at the all-women's pay-per-view Evolution, she defeats Sane to become the first ever two-time NXT Women's Champion, with this reign lasting for a full 416 days. And over the course of this one, Shayna would defeat an even stronger array of opponents, opponents who included the likes of Bianca Belair and Io Shirai. But that wasn't all she was doing as, while this was happening, she would also lead an invasion onto the main roster in time for November 2019's Survivor Series, with her taking on Raw and SmackDown Women's Champions Becky Lynch and Bayley in a triple threat match at that show, and handily beating them both. Unfortunately for her though, the reign of the Queen would have to come to an end at some point, so it was just as well she made it count then when, on the December 14th episode of NXT, the only episode of the black and gold brand to ever beat AEW in the ratings, she would fall to Rhea Ripley in the main event, with her putting the Australian over strong in the process. And with that done, it wouldn't be long before Baszler would be moved up to the main roster where, after a shaky start which saw her team with Nia Jax, she's recently started to turn things around with the appointment of Triple H as the new head of creative. Of course, one person who never really had to worry about Triple H being in charge of his creative direction, however, was a man who, even during the darkest days of Raw, was able to make something good out of it with the Hurt Business. A couple of decades before this though, he was getting his start in the industry at the relatively old age of 29. Who are we talking about this time? MVP. Yes, back in 2002, after spending a spell in prison, Montel Vontavious Porter would decide to turn his life around when he got involved in wrestling. And as it happened, he turned out to be a natural at the craft, so much so that, after spending a few years learning on the indies, he'd be signed up to a contract with WWE in 2005. 
From there, he'd spend a period in Deep South Wrestling, all before being called up to the main roster the following year to get into a feud with Kane. And after that, he'd become a United States Champion upon beating Chris Benoit, something which solidified his spot as a top player in the mid-card for what he saw as the foreseeable future. What he didn't realize at the time, though, was that his future was about to change quickly. And that was because, after being released from WWE in 2010, he'd be forced to go out and prove himself elsewhere, most notably with the likes of New Japan Pro Wrestling and Total Nonstop Action Wrestling. But, with defeat not being an option, he'd excel in each of these, particularly in the former, where he would not only become the inaugural IWGP Intercontinental Champion, but he'd also at one point score a rare submission victory over the legendary Hiroshi Tanahashi. Of course, by 2018, though, he'd have returned to his first home, with him this time getting to play more of a managerial role as he became the de facto leader of the Hurt Business, one of the best stables on Raw over the last decade. And this has seen him not only get to flex his in-ring skills when he's called upon, but also utilize his excellent mic work, too. Maybe he could teach some of the latter to our next entry then, because despite spending a period on the commentary booth, Steve McMichael would never really shine verbally. That said, before he hit the ring, it was all about what he'd been able to do physically during his career as a defensive tackle for the Chicago Bears. Once that career ended in 1995, however, McMichael would decide he wanted to enter the wrestling ring instead after he'd been involved in the WrestleMania 11 main event between fellow football star Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow. The only problem was that by this point he was 38 years old, something which definitely put some limitation on him. Still, it wasn't like it stopped him from becoming a success in this new world anyway as, after a year on the WCW roster, he'd have become the newest member of the Four Horsemen. On top of that, he'd at one point win the United States title from Jeff Jarrett, with this proving he had what it took to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them in the ring. In the years since, however, his life has been filled with difficulty, as after developing ALS in 2021, he's been confined to a wheelchair. But while things have not gone well for him, someone who was in WCW at the same time, often on the other side of the ring as a member of the NWO, life remains good. Of course, we're talking here about the one and only Kevin Nash. That said, Nash's career in wrestling didn't get started until he was 31 as, at that point, after having a prior career as a basketball player, he'd be scouted by WCW, where he'd be brought in to play a number of infamously terrible roles, such as Master Blaster Steel and Oz. Luckily then, things would go much better when, after jumping to WWF soon after this, he'd be given the role of Diesel, a role which quickly saw him be pushed as the new face of the company after winning the WWF title in 1994. With that run ultimately failing to translate into box office though, it would be two years later that Nash decided to try his luck elsewhere when, alongside his click buddy Scott Hall, he'd go back over to WCW to become a founding member of the NWO. A stable which, with the added star power of Hulk Hogan, would go on to revolutionize the industry and start the first sparks of the late 90s boom period. And after that, it really didn't matter what he did as he was a made man forever, something the big man often took to heart as he made his effort to make as much money as possible by doing as little as he could. But given he knew he only had so much time on the clock, maybe this was understandable, and something every other entry on this list would have surely felt like they could see the logic behind. After all, their late starts made it so that each of them knew they only had so much time with which to make an impact, and perhaps that's all why they did so well in their own ways then, whether it be by conquering the main event scene, carving out a nice spot on the mid-card, or continuing to rise up the card to this day, their time being far from over yet. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.